Ah, the chainsaw, the favorite tool of lumberjacks, ice carvers, extreme jugglers, and leather mask serial killers everywhere. With its brute cutting power and high rate of user injuries, over 36,000 every year in the United States alone, you could be forgiven for thinking that this rather terrifying machine was always meant to be used on trees and nowhere near the human body. If so, I regret to inform you that you would be horrifically wrong. If you're the squeamish sort, you'd best turn off the video right about now. For the disturbing truth is that the chainsaw was originally invented to cut into women's lady bits to assist with difficult childbirths. This is the gruesome story of how the tree surgeon's best friend got its start in real surgery. As previously covered in our Today I Found Out video, Twilight Sleep, the horrifying way in which early 20th century women gave birth, childbirth has always been a harrowing affair, particularly in the days before widespread sanitation and anesthetics. Even in today's world of modern medicine, the miracle of birth is fraught with complications, including the somewhat common problem of the baby becoming stuck during delivery. This can happen for a variety of reasons, including breech birth, that is, the baby coming out feet first, or the baby's head or shoulders becoming wedged in a narrow birth canal. Whatever the cause, much like when spelunking in tight tunnels, getting stuck in a lady's hoo-ha is extremely dangerous, in this case for the mother and child. Today, the most common solution is to perform a cesarean, or c-section, in which the uterus and woman in question is sliced and diced in order to remove the baby that way, and if you're of the US citizen persuasion, make it so you probably need to take out a second mortgage on your house to pay for your doctor's vacation home. And hey, if you're lucky enough to have complications after that, to pay for their kids' college educations too. Historians debate when the first cesarean sections were performed or even where the common name for this procedure came from. The most commonly cited origin for the term is that Roman general and emperor Julius Caesar was delivered in this manner. However, this is extremely unlikely, as until relatively recently this procedure was, at least as far as historic accounts go, always fatal for the mother up until the 19th century when we get the first known survivor of the procedure in Britain, and shortly thereafter in America. That said, we should note there is a reference to one successful procedure in the 16th century in Switzerland. Funny enough, not performed by any sort of doctor, but by a pig castrator who operated on his own wife and sewed her up the same way he did pigs in his day job. However, this instance wasn't well documented and didn't pop up at all until a century after it supposedly took place, so it's uncertain as to the accuracy. Going back to Caesar, his mother Aurelia is recorded as having lived long enough to hear of her son's conquest of Britain. Thus, more likely the name derives from Caesar's later imperial decree that women who were likely to die in childbirth were to undergo C-sections in order to save the child. Historians have also suggested that the name derives from the Latin word sedare, to cut, or sesonis, the term applied to children delivered after the mother had died. On this to cut origin, Pliny the Elder wrote that one of Caesar's ancestors was born via C-section and was named as such, stating, the first two of the Caesars was so named from his having been removed by an incision in his mother's womb. Also noteworthy here is that both Julius and Caesar were family names, and indeed the first to bear the Caesar name in his lineage was named Numerius Julius Caesar. Whatever the exact origin of the term there, what is known is, as alluded to, that for much of history the C-section was a crude and gruesome operation of last resort, as is made graphically clear by Dr. John L. Richmond of Ohio, who, in 1830, performed the first successful C-section recorded in the United States or at least where the mother survived. In his account, published in the Western Journal of Medical and Physical Sciences, Richmond paints a dramatic picture of attending to a mother in labor in a half-finished log cabin, the wind from a thunderstorm howling through gaps through the walls and continuously blowing out his candles. The good doctor states, after doing all in my power for her preservation and feeling myself entirely in the dark as to her situation and finding that whatever was done must be done soon and feeling a deep and solemn sense of my responsibility responsibility with only a case of common pocket instruments, about one o'clock I commenced the cesarean section. Using a pair of crooked scissors, Richmond made a curved incision across the mother's abdomen and attempted to reach in and extract the baby. However, he states, as the fetus was uncommonly large and the mother very fat and having no assistance, I found this part of my operation more difficult than I had anticipated. Eventually, the mother, unable to endure the pain, begged Richmond to stop. Richmond realized that, to quote him, a childless mother is better than a motherless child. I altered course and proceeded to remove the fetus in pieces from the 
the wound in the mother's abdomen. Cheese and crackers, the past was the worst. And what is wrong with that doctor? Basically 100% of women died of a C-section before. So halfway through, he feels it's better to dice up the baby and hope this woman is one of the first to live? Logically, this wasn't a choice of a childless mother versus a motherless child, but reasonably assuming the second you started cutting up the baby, just being done with both of them. A million ways to die in the West was right. Incredibly, in this case, the mother survived the procedure, returning to work only 24 days later. However, as noted, such success stories were virtually non-existent before this. So starting in the 16th century, obstetricians instead turned to a procedure called the symphysiotomy. This involved cutting through the pubic symphysis, the cartilage joint between the two pubic bones, allowing the birth canal to be widened and the baby delivered more normally. Though less dangerous than a C-section, early symphysiotomies were performed with conventional surgical knives and were slow, extremely painful, and carried the risk of shock, infection, and other complications. So naturally, in 1780, Scottish doctors John Aitken and James Jeffrey at Glasgow University invented the precursor of the modern chainsaw to speed up the procedure. Procedure. Their device resembled a large carving knife with a segmented blade based on a watch chain wrapped around an oval guide and driven by a hand crank. While the thought of a doctor going to down on your undercarriage with a literal chainsaw might seem like the stuff of horror movies, thanks to the speed of the operation, the device was successful in reducing the pain and trauma inflicted by symphysiotomies. It continued to be used until the 1890s when it was superseded by the simpler and more effective Zeely Twisted Wire Saw, invented by Italian obstetrician Leonardo Zeely. However, as we shall later see, even when performed with the most modern instruments, symphysiotomies can lead to devastating side effects for the mother, such as chronic pain, incontinence, and loss of mobility. The next chapter in the development of the chainsaw came in 1830 when German physician and inventor Bernard Hein invented the osteotome, a hand-cranked chain blade device similar to Aitken and Jeffrey's invention designed to cut through bone. Previously, amputations had been performed using chisels or hand-operated bone saws, which were slow to use and subjected patients to excruciating hammering or jerking motions. The osteotome, by contrast, cut through bone quickly and smoothly, minimizing trauma and post-operative complications. The device took the surgical world by storm, winning the prestigious Montheon Prize in 1835, and Hein a personal invitation by Tsar Nicholas I to demonstrate his invention across Russia. Hein would later develop a variety of attachments for the osteotome, such as special guards and guides to protect surrounding tissue from damage and allow operations on delicate body parts like the skull. Decades later, other inventors would fit the saw with electric motors, making it even more effective. It was not until the end of the 19th century, however, that anyone thought to apply the chainsaw for the cutting of materials other than bone and cartilage. One of the first patents for what we would today recognize as a chainsaw, however, was granted to Frederick L. McGaw of Flatlands, New York, in 1883. However, McGaw's device consisted of a chain stretched between two grooved drums and was intended for static use in sawmills, much like a modern bandsaw. 22 years later, in 1905, Samuel J. Benz of San Francisco patented a chainsaw incorporating the now familiar elliptical guide frame. Though smaller than McGaw's design, Benz saw was still a massive wheeled affair requiring two people to operate it and was intended for felling giant redwood trees. The first portable chainsaw was patented by Canadian James Shand in 1918 and later produced by German company Festo, today Festool, starting in 1933. Around the same time, American inventor Joseph Buford Cox invented the modern chipper-style chain with alternating left and right cutting teeth, basing his invention on the jaws of the larvae of the wood-eating timberman beetle. This Oregon chain would go on to become standard in nearly every chainsaw design going forward. However, for many years, limitation in materials and engine design prevented the development of a truly portable engine-driven chainsaw, with the earliest portable models being electric and requiring a separate generator to power them. It was not until after the Second World War that improvements in aluminum casting and two-stroke engine design allowed the production of the portable gasoline-powered chainsaws we know and love today, with one of the first to reach the market being the 1959 Husqvarna Model 90. 
And the rest, as they say, is history there. As for the medical procedure that originally inspired the chainsaw's creation, advancements in anesthetics and antiseptic surgery in the late 19th and early 20th centuries dramatically increased the survivability of C-sections, Mother of God thankfully rendering the symphysotomy all but obsolete. After the 1930s, the procedure was no longer performed in the developed world, with one tragic exception. Because why not end this on a happy note? Between 1944 and 1987, an estimated 1,500 women in the Republic of Ireland were subjected to symphysotomies during childbirth, the procedure being performed without the patient's knowledge or consent and often resulted in debilitating complications, as one anonymous woman who underwent a symphysotomy in 1981, yes, even the recent past was the worst, reporting in a 2014 Guardian interview. They gave me gas and air and an injection and took me to another room, where they tied my legs up on each side. There were two nurses on each side of me. I saw this doctor at the end of my bed with a big, long silver thing. They made a hole in your private parts, and he inserted this silver thing up and cut the pubic bone and pushed it over to widen your pelvis for you to deliver your baby yourself. I hold down a job, but only because of the painkillers. I have arthritis in my hip and in the bottom of my spine. I walk with a limp. No one can help. There's no way back. Getting up and down stairs or getting up on a chair, I can't really do. You get one leg up, then the other slips down. I'm also incontinent. I wear pads the whole time and have been since the age of 23. My sisters all had babies and none had this problem. A lot of people might have a little leak, but this is a whole flow. It's very embarrassing. The justification for imposing this archaic and traumatizing procedure was not medical in these cases, but religious. At the time, the medical consensus was that having more than three C-sections was dangerous, and that further pregnancies should be prevented through sterilization or contraception. This, however, ran afoul of traditional Catholic beliefs, including those of Alex Spain, the master of Dublin's National Maternity Hospital from 1942 to 1948. Following Catholic orthodoxy regarding contraception, in 1944, Spain led a campaign to discourage C-sections and revive the use of symphysotomies throughout Ireland, citing his opposition to the, to quote, mutilating operation of sterilization and marital difficulty. His successor, Arthur Berry, was even more fanatical, ensuring the survival of the procedure for another four decades. It was not until the 1990s that the scale of the practice became widely known, and not until 2014 that the United Nations Human Rights Committee called on the Irish government to launch an investigation. Later that year, around 300 women who underwent non-consensual symphysotomies received compensation sums ranging between £40,000 and £120,000. This tragic episode is just one of a long line of abuses perpetuated against Irish women by the Catholic Church, such as the Magdalene Asylums where, for more than 200 years, tens of thousands of unwed mothers were exploited for their labor in church-run laundries, with hundreds of their children dying of neglect. So yeah, the origins of the chainsaw. Yay.